Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for coming. I, it's bittersweet because while I'm seeing less people in the audience uh, in person, it makes me happy that I know I'll be able to afford uh, all of the gifts that I'm going to be buying for people for attending all six. Um, there is a sign-up sheet in the back. Even if you haven't been to all six, it'd be great to put you on that. Um, we won't over-spam you with um, uh, you know, email. But what I would like to do is at least give you summaries of kind of where you can go for additional crypto stuff, any other advisements Josh has, links to the ResNet uh, broadcast so that you can share amongst your team and or go watch again because um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't feel very smart now that I'm in session four. Um, I know there's a lot smarter people than me. I think they're sitting down and not standing up talking. So um, uh, I'm not going to... I mean, I, I, I always want to introduce you as like the guy that we should yeah. depend on for crypto information. Yeah. Um, but I, I am, again, pleased that you're here to do this. And I think that we all have um, a lot a lot to thank you for with the information that you're giving us. So okay. I hope to get a little bit to take away from myself, even <laughs> though some of it's over my head now, but uh, hopefully not for the rest of you guys. So. Well. Hopefully this will be motivating. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, hopefully like some who are like me. We still keep coming and we still learn from uh, from some of the areas that we do understand. So let's give a round of applause for Josh. Please. We'll see you out there. All right, thank you, Justin. And um, I don't know if if you're really nice to him, you might be able to convince him that five out of six is enough. I don't know if <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's not up to me. It's up to him, right? Okay. Um, and a, a quick warning as I get started, um, we'll have some time for questions afterwards, but uh, I have to get to SeaTac. Um, my, my flight was originally scheduled for 4 o'clock, which meant I'd have to run out, but now it's 4.30. So I, I don't have to run, but still, uh, I, I, yes. Uh, so anyway, um, and, and actually I'll be on another trip. I get back just before the session in two weeks, but that I have a little bit more leeway. Okay, so. Uh, where are we? Well, last time we talked about um, the, the basics of asymmetric crypto. We talked about um, the Diffie-Hellman protocol. We talked about the Rivest Shamir Edelman protocol, best known as RSA, and the dis digital signature algorithm, or, uh, DSA. What we're going to do today is talk about special forms, non-integer forms of asymmetric crypto, in particular elliptic curves, elliptic curve systems, and lattices and lattice-based systems. Most of the time will be on elliptic. But before we do that, I want to start with something that probably, well, logically belongs with the last session. Um, but um, timing-wise, it's good to, to squeeze it in here. Um, so all of those three things that we talked about last time um, began with the following in some form or another. Pick a large prime or a couple of large primes, and then. And it was pointed out to me by a few people afterwards that I never really mentioned how you get large primes. <laughs> so I'm going to spend just a few minutes on that to, cover it, to, to finish covering that. And in fact, everything we do today is also going to require being able to pick large primes. So it, it does fit in here as well. So the question we have to answer is, how do we do this? How do we find big primes? And the basic technique is pretty simple. You run through a loop something like this. Pick a large random number, see if it's prime. If not, repeat. OK, so how long is this going to take, first of all? Um, there's a very important theorem in number theory called the prime number theorem that says how many primes there are. So one out of every 0.7n n-bit integers is prime. That, that 0.7 is actually, it, it approaches natural log of 2. That's where that comes from. Um, but if you're looking for 100-bit primes, one out of every 70 100-bit primes. If you're looking for 1,000-bit primes, one out of 700. So if you just follow this simple loop, you'll have to go through about 700 times to find uh, each of the 1,000-bit primes that you need to select to, to set up RSA, for instance. OK, so um, I have begged the question, though, of how do you check to see if it's prime? Now that we know 
the prime number theorem, you know how many primes there are. How do you do this check? So, if you remember from last time, we talked about Fermat's little theorem. This nice little theorem that says if you have a prime number, then if you take any x, x to the pth power is congruent mod p. If you reduce it mod p, you get the same thing as x or x mod p. So if you, in particular, if you take something smaller than p, raise it to the pth power, you should get back to where you started from. Um, this is true for all primes. So if you take an x and raise it to the pth power and you get something else back, you know you've got something that's not prime. So we've got a really good way of finding not primes, which isn't exactly what we want here. But it turns out that this, while it's true for whenever you have a prime, it's almost never true in any practical sense if p is not prime. So there are a few very screwy minor exceptions and, and, and such. But in practice, if you pick a big random number and then you pick some, something smaller than it, going to have to be bigger than 1, but pick something random in the range of 2 to p minus 1, or 2 to p minus 2 probably. But anything random is going to be somewhere you know, in the middle. Um, raise it to the pth power. If you get x back, it's prime. You can, this is how we check for primality in you know, our code. And you know, I think we've done it millions and millions of times. And I would wager that we have never randomly picked something that was not prime and had this check come out even once. Now, in practice, we, we run it several times, to be sure. But you know, it's, just, it's almost never the case. Um, so we can actually do a little bit better than this. I uh, just want to you know, say quickly that we can speed things up uh, by this trick. Instead of just picking a large random number, let's pick a large random number that we think has some good chance of being prime and test only those instead of just testing every random number out there. So check if that's prime and go back. Slightly smarter version of the prime uh, generation protocol. And the way of being slightly smarter is to introduce a sieve. So the idea of the sieve is we pick a random starting point, and we figure out we have this array. It might be maybe 1,000 bits long. It's just a bit array with maybe 1,000 long. And what we do is find the first value in this array, just do a quick calculation, that's divisible by 2. So all this is is take n mod 2 and figure out, OK, you know, that's where it is. And then we say, OK, once we have the first multiple of 2, that's also a multiple of 2. That's also, we just go through the array and set all those values to 1. And then we figure out where the first multiple of 3 is. We set that to 1. And then we go through every third, set that. We don't even test what's already there. If it's 0 or 1, doesn't matter. We just set it to 1. Set it to 1, set it to 1, go through there. Go through 5, set it to 1, set it to 1, set it to 1. OK? Go through small primes. In practice, maybe we'll keep a list of the, the thousand smallest primes and go through this. But you see, after not very long, you have only a couple of reasonable candidates left. And we will do the primality testing just on the remaining candidates. So this is a good way of sort of thinning the herd very quickly so that you don't waste a lot of time doing this you know, large exponentiation when you could just quickly find the likely primes here. Um, now, this does, we have to be a little bit careful, introduce some skewing. We're not getting random primes anymore. If you want really random primes, you shouldn't use a, a, a sieve like this. Because imagine these are both prime here. If what I do is take the first prime I run into, I, you know, I check that, oh, that's prime, I stop, then I'm much less likely to, to pick that as my prime than that. Well, I could say, OK, well, pick the second one first. Well, you're going to get into problems. If, if you've got just one prime in the, the range that you sieve versus two primes in the range that you sieve, the, the, the range that has just one prime, that prime is far more likely to be picked than, a range, than one of the primes in the range that has two primes, no matter how I do it. Yep, question? How much disk space would, say, the first 1,000-bit primes occupy? Like, can we just store them all once? Uh, can oh, we yeah. one store and pick one at random? The, well, the, Mm, no, no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> um, because, um, no, first of all, um, 
there are huge numbers of 1,000-bit primes. Um, basically, if you do that calculation, divide 2 to the 1,000 by natural log of, of 2. No, sorry, uh, natu natural log of 2 to the 1,000, so 1,000 times natural log of 2. Um, so you've got more than you could possibly store total. If you've got an amount that you can store and somebody knows these are the ones you've stored, then they can just go through and look and find all those. You, you want it to be really random each time. You don't want to store them or keep them someplace where somebody else might run into them. I mean, store the whole set and just pick one at random or attack. Well, do you mean really the whole set of 1,000-bit primes? Yes. Well, you cannot possibly store that. There are not enough atoms in the universe <laughs> to, <enough>. to store <laughs> all 1,000-bit primes. Right? Um, there are something like 2 to the 250 particles in the universe and there are something around two to the nine hundred something <laughs> thousand bit primes. <laughs> okay, just the uh, and, you know, high nine hundreds, in fact, for, for whatever that matters. Okay, so we introduced a little bit of skewing when we do this. It doesn't really matter. And we bound the skewing. We don't you know, skew arbitrarily, whatnot. Um, I also let, let me just quickly mention a, a little story here because it's kind of fun. One of the first things I did when I came to Microsoft literally almost 20 years ago, not quite, about 19, um, was looked at the, the code that was doing this and looked at, um, it was doing exactly this. Um, start out, you know, sieve out twos. And you know, I said, wait a minute. Um, do we really have to sieve out even numbers? We kind of know, you know even, that there's this sophisticated theorem in, uh, in, in mathematics that says there are no large even primes, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a small one, but if we're looking for a big... So the, the step way back here of sieving out multiples of two, all we had to do was just compress the array, take the, the array basically half the size, and then if every third odd integer is divisible by three, and every fifth odd integer, and just Effectively, you use exactly the same table, exactly the same process. Um, I literally changed four lines of code because it's just interpreting where the starting position is a little bit differently. And then it's the nth odd integer afterwards instead of the nth integer afterwards or the, the ith integer that you find. Almost exactly the same. Four, literally touched four lines of code. I got a ship it award for NT4. <laughs> for four, that might be a record. But I had people coming to me the next day and say, hey, you checked. It's 30% faster at finding primes. What did you do? I applied this sophisticated theorem. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I was surprised it was that much faster. But it really, it's spending a lot of time at the beginning um, just you know, going through. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's it on primes. Any prime questions before we go on? OK. So now we can move into elliptic curves. Um, and the first question, if you want to deal with elliptic curve cryptosystems, is just what are elliptic curves? Um, and just a note, these are, don't expect to see ellipses here. These have practically nothing to do with the, the connection with ellipses is conic sections in a very bizarre way that you never see. So don't think about ellipses here. These are elliptic curves. There's something different. And by the way, there are a few ringers in the audience who are going to catch me on anything I say. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can. But anyway, so what's an elliptic curve? So we go to the source of all knowledge <laughs> and get a definition. OK, in mathematics, an elliptic curve is a smooth projective algebraic curve of genus 1 with, with a specified point O. It's, in fact, an abelian variety with a multiplication defined algebraically with respect to which the necessarily commutative, it's a necessarily commutative group. Et cetera, et cetera. OK, good. We know what an elliptic curve is, right? <laughs> well, maybe we can do this a little bit more easily. An elliptic curve, something that looks like that. That's an elliptic curve. And you could actually have a term, a, an x squared term here or non uh, one coefficient. You could have a y, uh, you know, a linear term of y there. But it turns out all those things uh, <coughs> you can remove by you know, simple change of variables and these sort of translations and things. So this is considered the general form for an elliptic curve. Any elliptic curve can be shifted to look like this. So there are just two constants to worry about, and that describes the curve. OK, 
So what does one of these things look like if we try to graph it? They are really weird. Right? There's x cubed minus 4x plus 0.67. So those are the two constants there, minus 4 and plus 0.67. You get something that looks like this. Or something that can look like that. Here are two. They look very different, but the only difference is plus 1. <laughs> okay? Another, another really strange looking one. Another there. Okay. So why does it look that way? Where do you get that strange shape? Well, to understand this, let's start off by sort of eliminating that square and just start looking at this. This is a curve that you probably all graphed in high school, right? It's a simple cubic polynomial. Looks kind of like this, okay? And in particular, since the coefficient here is 1, then it starts off, it goes to negative infinity down on the left and positive infinity down on the right, uh, up on the right. Okay, so it looks something like this. It's got a couple of humps. Um, if you know, in, in some cases, those humps can move together and merge, but generally not. Gen you know, the general case looks kind of like that. So, what happens when we put that square back? Well, the first thing that happens is now we only care about values that are positive, right? We want to take effectively the square root of this curve. So, all the places where this wound up negative goes away. We sort of flatten this out because we're taking the square root. And I'm not going to show it because it looks kind of the same. It's kind of flattened here. And then notice that if positive y is a solution, then negative y is a solution to the same thing. So we have symmetry across the x-axis. So that's why we get something that looks kind of like that. And the various forms come from where these humps are in the cubic. So if we start here, and do the same thing, cut off the negatives and reflect, we just get a simple curve over here. No extra parts. If we start there with both of these, the, the local max and the local min, above the x-axis, then when we cut things off and flip, we get something that looks like that. Okay? So you know, these are the reasons for these, these different odd shapes, but they all come from basically the same thing. Now, things do get kind of weird if you get either the min or the max exactly touching the x-axis and not crossing it. So we just want to eliminate those cases from our consideration here. Um, that, and to do that, we just eliminate the, that possibility. So we just rule out that for, for the constants a and b. OK, now you know what an elliptic curve is. I have to spend a couple minutes telling you about some math, telling you about mathematical groups. If you ever took a discrete math course or basic um, um, college algebra course, you, you may have seen mathematical groups. A group is a set of objects together with an operator, a single operator. I'm writing it as multiplication here. You could write it somewhat differently. And it satisfies four properties. The first property is that one of the elements in this group is an identity, such that if I pl apply that operator and the identity, to some element in that group, any element in the, the group, I get that element back, whether I apply on the left or the right. Okay, That's the identity property. There are inverses in groups always. Every element has an inverse such that if I apply this operator to the inverse and the element, I get the identity in bo both ways. The third property is associativity, which means I can group things in either way. Basically, if I'm just saying a times b times c, whether I do it as a times b times c or a times b times c, I get the same thing. If you think back, this is why Diffie-Hellman works, right? In Diffie-Hellman, you're taking g to the a to the b or g to the b to the a. You're still doing a times b g's, but you're, doing, you're grouping them differently, and you need associativity to work. But whenever you have a group, Associ you have associativity, and Diffie-Hellman will work. The final property is closure, which just says if I apply the operator to two things in the group, I get something in the group. OK? So just to get a quick understanding of these things, I'm going to give you some examples of some groups and some not groups. If I take the integers, whole numbers, positive and negative, including 0, 0 is the identity if I have addition as my operator. Right? Add 0, I get back to where I started. No problem. 
Um, and all the other properties, inverses exist, right? The inverse of three is negative three, et cetera. But the integers with subtraction, multiplication, or division, none of those are, um, are groups. So maybe subtraction is a little subtle. Is that clear why subtraction doesn't work? The property it loses on is that associativity property. One minus one minus one. One minus one minus one is different from one minus one minus one. So associativity doesn't work there. Multiplication, well, you don't have an inverse of two even, right? One half, that's not a whole number. That's not an integer. So you don't have inverses there. Division just messes up on all sorts of things because associativity doesn't work and you don't have inverses. And, you know, division's not close. Okay, rational numbers, fractions, things of the form A over B. Again, with addition, zero is the identity, still works there. Okay? Again, subtraction, multiplication, division don't work. Basically the same reasons, except note we get kind of close with multiplication. We have an inverse for two, one half, that's in there. So we have it. Problem is we don't have an inverse of zero. So if we take that out, the non-zero rationals with multiplication, one is the identity, we do get a group. Okay? A couple of other examples. The integers mod n. The finite set zero through n minus one. We do our addition mod n as our operation. Zero is the identity, that's a group. The inverse of one is n minus one. You add them together and you get zero. The inverse of two is n minus two, okay? One other group I'll mention is the integers with multiplication mod p and no zero, one through p minus one, if p is prime. If p is prime, then that turns out to be a group. If p is not prime, it won't be a group. You won't get inverses of some of the elements in there. But if P is prime, you'll, it'll always be a group. Okay, and I'm not telling you how to compute inverses, but you can, you can figure it out. You can always find the inverse of two is going to be P plus one divided by two. And since P is odd for most primes, P plus one over two is, P, P plus one is even divided by two and you'll find something and whatever. I, you, you, can, you can generalize that. It, it'll, it would take some time to show you how to do division there, but it's all doable. It works. Okay, so now we can get to elliptic groups. And the way we're going to get there is we're going to look at what happens when you take an elliptic curve. There's our generic elliptic curve, that form, and intersect it with just a straight line. So here's a typical straight line. Any straight line that's not vertical can be written this way. Okay? So let's see what happens. If we take the elliptic curve, and that non-vertical straight line, we've just got these two equations here. Substitute this in for y, and you get ax plus b squared equals this. If I just move the x's around, I don't really need to do the calculation. This is cubic in x. x cubed plus something x squared plus something x plus something equals zero, if I just move things around here. Okay, how many solutions are to this? Are, are there to this? Well, this is our friendly cubic equation again, our cubic polynomial again. The solutions are wherever this crosses the x-axis, wherever it's zero, zeros of the polynomial. So, our typical case there, we're going to have three solutions. But in general, if the curve is up here, there's going to be only one solution. If it comes down to right where it just touches and goes back up. This tangent case, this very narrow case, you get two solutions. Here's another common case, you get three solutions. As it goes down to there, there are two solutions again, but that's just a very narrow case. And then down here, there's one solution. There's always at least one, okay? So you've got either one intersection point or three intersection points most of the time between the curve and that straight line. But you can, in this tangent case, these, these exceptional cases, you can get two intersection points. Okay, just want to bring in vertical lines also. A vertical line is x equals c. Is the vertical line. How does that intersect this elliptic uh, curve? Well, you have something very similar. We can substitute in 
here, x equals c, and you just get y squared equals some constant. If that constant is positive, there are two solutions. y squared equals 4 has plus and minus 2 as solutions. If the constant's negative, you get no solutions. And if that constant is exactly 0, you're going to get one solution. So you've got those three cases, just one fewer intersection point, effectively. 0 and 2 are common. 1 is uncommon. OK, why am I telling you all this? <laughs> why should you care in the slightest? Well, what I'm going to do, um, and I'm not claiming that this is anything, you know, I know, I just learned this from others. I'm going to take these, these relations and make a group. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to take two points on the curve, any two points, and the operator that I'm going to form is to say, what happens if I take those two points and draw a line through them? Well, if I've got two separate points, then I've already got two intersections with a line. So the typical case, there's going to be a third intersection. So here's the, the place where the third intersection is. Two points gives a, a unique third point. But just to make things a little weird, I'm not going to take that point as the result. I'm going to take that point and take its negation, flip it over the x-axis. That point is going to be the result. So the group operation is going to say, take these two points, draw a line through them, hit the third intersection point, flip it, and that's going to be your result. OK, weird thing to do. It turns out, though, this gives you a group. If you go through all the associativity and um, inverse stuff, you'll get a group by doing this. Now, how do you add a point to itself? or multiply a point by itself, depending on how you label the, the operation. Well, here's where I'll use that tangent thing. It's sort of getting arbitrarily close to two points, getting closer and closer together. The line going through those two points as those two points actually merge becomes the tangent here that goes right along the curve. So that tangent case hits at exactly one other point. Great, because I want a unique result. Take that one other point, flip that, and I've got the result. So this handles almost everything. There are a few things that are left, and I just have to describe what to do in those few cases. Oh, there's the point. Sorry. Here's a point, and it's negative. It's inverse. There's the vertical line case when I draw a line through that. That doesn't hit anything else. Well, what I'm going to do for that case, or what is done for that case, is create one more point and attach it to this elliptic curve to create my elliptic group. That point is an artificial point. We call it i. Sometimes it's called a point at infinity. And it's going to handle that vertical line case. This special point also serves as the identity of the group. So let's just see what happens if I take this point off of infinity and sort of map it through this point here. It kind of goes down here because it, came, it was infinitely high or infinitely far away. It just comes straight down here, hits the opposite. And then when I flip it, like I've done with all the others, I get back to where I started. So it serves nicely as the identity, just intuitively. OK, so here are all the operations on this curve to, to, to create an elliptic group. Now, once we've done that, you can go back to high school for a while and do some geometry. You take two points here, but the x and the y values, compute the third point. The main case is when x and y are different, two different points. These are the equations you get. You can work it out for yourself. Tenth grade students should be able to work this out. I am not going to do that here, I promise. OK, there are a few other cases when x 1 and x2 are the same, and y1 and y2 are the same, and non-zero. This is the tangent case. This is the case of adding a point or multiplying a point by itself. That, you get these equations. OK, we get some more equations. The final equations are you get the identity if the things are negatives of each other, and the identity composed with any other point is that point. The identity composed with itself is the identity. OK, these are all the rules for an elliptic group. Hooray. At this point, forget about all those curves. Forget about all that geometry. 
these are just equations now. Okay? You've got some equations. They form a group. I'm not proving that to you. I'm just asserting that. But if you use those equations on points in the group, you will get other points in the group and everything will work well. Okay. So now you can do computation in elliptic groups. For any two points, you can now compute their composition. You can compute u times v. Okay? For any point and any integer, you can compute x to the rth power. Just multiply it by itself, r times. And now I want to be a little bit careful here. I'm using the multiplicative notation here. I'm describing the group operator as multiplication and saying repeating it is, is exponentiation. Um, I think it, it works better for cryptography and the things I'm going to show you to represent it multiplicatively. Most mathematicians like to represent elliptic groups additively. So they'll talk about the operation as addition and repeating the operation many times is just multiplication. Um, it would be a scalar multiplication. Either way, it's exactly the same thing. It looks very different, but it's exactly the same. Okay. So we can do large exponentiations now if we want to, right? We just do the repeated squaring trick that we saw in whether it was the first session or the second session early on. This repeated squaring trick gets us to a large power very quickly. So if we want to compute x to the 360th power, where x is a point on an elliptic curve, we just sort of square things up and take the, the side multiplies of the things that we wanted to get to x to the 360 without doing 360 of these elliptic curve operations. Okay? It's reasonably quick. All right. One more thing to say before we show how to use this in crypto is we in computer science like things to be finite, right? I mentioned that earlier. These elliptic groups are typically very large or potentially very large. Um, they could be infinite. Um, what I described before would be infinite. Um, picking a random number from an infinite set is very hard. Pick a random integer. Well, if I don't give you a bound, that random integer is infinitely large because there are very few com comparative integers that are not very, very large. So we want things to be finite. Well, what we're going to do is we've got a set of equations. Let me just finish this and get to it. We're going to do all those, those calculations mod some prime. Keep things finite. Just the way we were doing with RSA and Diffie-Hellman and whatnot before, we'll do those operations mod a prime. And for some technical reasons, we want that prime to be bigger than 3, because if you look at those equations before, if you've got 2s and 3s um, in, in there, you'll start dividing by 0 and things get ugly. Um, so pick a prime bigger than 3, typically a large prime, and we'll do exactly those algebraic computations that are inspired by geometry, but they're algebraic computations, mod this prime. OK, question. Are you dealing with uh, integers or floating point here? Uh, inter well, I'm dealing with integers effectively. I'm dealing, de dealing with integers mod p. So these are integers, and I will, w whenever I divide, I do a mod division, which gives another integer. But it's an integer always smaller than p. But the solutions, the x on the electric curve, they are floating point numbers, right? No, no. I mean, if they, but before I take the mod, mod um, uh, p, they're, they're rationals. Um, so they would be represented as floating point. We don't want to do that. We don't want to go there because they, that gets really ugly. That doesn't affect the mathematics. Well, we, we, in, in, oh. instead of doing these equations over the reals or over the rationals and, and getting you know, sort of arbitrarily messy things with you know, precision issues with, that, that we would deal with, we will instead, every time we, we pick a number, it's going to um, have uh, a point is going to be x, y, where x and y are both integers smaller than p. And every time we do those computations, we're going to do those computations mod p. And we're going to get results, which are another point, which is two integers less than p. Sorry, this is being super yeah. if, uh, if x and y are points on the electric curve, yep. you probably have a choice to pick only one as an integer. If you pick x as an integer, then y need not be an integer. 
Y is not an integer, but if you do, well, let me go all the way back to, to a, just a picture of the equation. This, this equation here, if I do the, take this mod P, so I take um, x um, qubit, take some big integer x qubit, add x, add b, a and b are integers, I can take a square root mod P, I'll also get an integer mod P. Now, I, I could spend some time, and you know, I, I'd recommend it if you, you really like this stuff, play around with you know, sort of small things, mod 11, mod 5, whatnot. You'll find things like, um, well, what, what's a good example? 2 cubed mod 7 is 1. 2 cubed is 8. So 1 has 3 cube roots. It's got 1, it's got 2, and it's got... Um, negative 2, which is 5. 5 cubed is 125, if I did that right, which mod 7 should be um, 1. Um, I think I got that right. Um, something seems wrong there, but anyway. Mm. What was the other one? Sorry? 4. Oh, 4. That's right. Four. Yes, because not, negative is not going to be, because other, yes. Thank you. See, I told you I had ringers in the crowd. 5 cubed is negative 1. Yeah. An operation for these curves, and we call it a group. But now we're calling it a finite field. Does, don't we need another operation to call it a finite? I field? haven't called it a finite field. I've, yeah. I've I've carefully avoided the term field here <laughs> or finite field. Um, we're doing one operation and only one. A field has two operations. Um, what did I have? Do I have? Do I? Do I have field anywhere here? If I do, I didn't mean to. Oh, yeah, okay, over a finite field. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, okay, I didn't say what a field is. Um, so basically you have two operations in a field. You know, think of the, um, the, you, the real numbers with addition and multiplication, and that gets you a, a, a field. Um, but um, I don't want to go into fields here. Basically, all, all, this, all, all the things we have to do here are just mod p um, with the one elliptic group operation um, on top and the, the arithmetic at the base is all mod p. Think of it that way. Um, what it gets you is division works. And if you, back to this equation, see over here there's a division, here there's a division, some divisions there. You, you need to be able to do division, um, you know, mod 7, what's 3 divided by 2? Well, 3 divided by 2 is the thing that you can multiply 2 by to get 3. Turns out to be 5. 2 times 5 is 10, mod 7 is 3. How I computed that? Well, that's small well, trial and error. But you, you can do, there's, there's a way of computing that for big numbers. I just, you know, I could show you. We could spend some time. It's called the extended Euclidean algorithm. It, it's not that hard, but... I don't want to spend the time. OK, so we're doing these operations mod p now. Everything's mod p. There's, no, there's just algebra now, no geometry, doing all this mod p. We're good. OK, once we have that, we have this notation. E sub p of a, b refers to the elliptic group that you get when you take this curve and you do the operations mod p. OK, that's our notation. Now we get back to crypto. Remember Diffie-Hellman? Long time back. Diffie-Hellman was the process of pick a prime P and some starting point G. It's, these are agreed to public values. Alice over here takes a random A. G to the A is her public key. Bob picks a random private key B. G to the B is his public key and they exchange the values, and they apply their private keys to what they receive, and they get back a common key. OK? Diffie-Hellman. Well, can we do Diffie-Hellman over elliptic groups instead of over the integers? Well, what has to change? Here, we're starting with a public point on an elliptic curve um, of that form. OK? G is that. Then 
we're doing the same exponentiation, repeating the group operation, but this is the group that we're working in. We're not um, doing multiplication over the integers anymore, or multiplication mod p anymore. We're doing these multiplications in this elliptic group according to the equations that I, I showed you earlier. And down here, there's another exponentiation, so we'll do that in that group. And then this comes out exactly the same. We still get a common key that way. Diffie-Hellman works in really exactly the same way here or in any group. So why do we care about what group we're doing it in? Well, we care because of how hard it is to break Diffie-Hellman. What an attacker sees is the starting point G and the two public keys that are exchanged by each of Alice and Bob. And, ooh, that's supposed to be G to the AB. I don't, don't know what happened there. G to the AB. Take a marker and, um, okay. Sorry about that. Back to the previous slide, I was yeah. confused by A and B. You have capital A and capital B in two places, and I can't see why they'd be the same. Capital A. The one. The one's in the curve definition. Yeah. Oh, are those different A's? Those are different A's and B's. Okay. So in that I'm case, sorry. That, those A's, bad. A's and B's are preset public? Yes, my bad, my bad. Um, you know, I had a previous version of that where I changed the variables to U and V, and I, I changed them back here because I wanted to be consistent with the Diffie-Hellman that I did earlier. Bad, my bad. So, okay. This A and B have nothing to do with this A and B. They look completely different, right? <laughs> okay. So the entire elliptic curve, yes. including P I'm, and A and B, are public yes, and the, shared ahead of time. Yes. Um, initial points G, P, capital A, capital B here, these are all public values. Once you've done that, please forget about that A and B and start with a new A and B right. down here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Practice. Does that change? Is there one? Elliptic curve that everybody uses? Uh, generally, there's a small set of elliptic curves that have been well vetted. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. In fact, we have a little project going on to find really good elliptic curves for things. But, but generally, yes, um, you could generate a new elliptic curve every time. But we all typically use one of a few. There are some that have come through NIST and the US government that people don't seem to want to use as much anymore as they did six months ago. Um, but still, the most common ones, there, there, are, there are a bunch of curves around, the common curves. And we, we support the common curves. Um, OK. So back to this breaking. Um, so the most effective attack on Diffie-Hellman um, is basically to compute discrete logs. This over the integers or over elliptic curves. If I could get one of a little a or little b, then that's enough for me to compute. If I could get little a, I have g to the b, so I could raise that to the little a power. So I have to compute one discrete log. Um, and that's, that's the best known attack of any kind. Now, over the integers, there are some ways of doing discrete logs better than effectively exhaustive search. There's something called the index calculus. It's a sub-exponential algorithm. It's very slow. You get up over about 1,000 bits, and it becomes wildly impractical. But you can do 1,000 bits, and you can't do an exhaustive search through a space of 2 to the 1,000. So you, know, you can you know, get some improvement. It's a real improvement. There is no similar sub-exponential algorithm known for discrete logs in elliptic groups. Therefore, we can get away with smaller primes, smaller sizes of things, and still feel secure, at least secure against best, best currently known attacks. So why do we want to use elliptic curves? Really, it's efficiency. Um, you know, the elliptic curves are a hot thing. You've heard a lot of people say, yeah, that's the new thing. We should use them. The, the big benefit is efficiency, right? Um, and here are just some numbers. 160-bit elliptic curve takes roughly the same amount of time to compute discrete logs on uh, as a 1024-bit um, um, integer. It's roughly equivalent to 1024-bit um, Diffie-Hellman or 1024-bit RSA, which we feel is no longer very secure. We want to go up a little bit higher. 
256 bit elliptic curves are what we typically use. And we feel comfortable with that. That has roughly this strength. And when we use RSA now or Diffie-Hillman now over the integers, we're typically using 2048-bit. OK? So if we use 256-bit elliptic curves, then we have shorter keys, shorter ciphertext. Um, everything is smaller um, than our 2048-bit integer algorithm. OK? So th there's a real opportunity for improvement there, especially if you're on small devices. Why not? Well, elliptic curves have been studied, I'm saying far less. Um, over recent years, they've gotten a lot more studying, so still less. You know, integers have, have been, uh, and integer factorization in particular, has been studied for centuries, since the time of Gauss, um, probably even before that. Um, not so much for elliptic curves, but they're seeming more and more robust. So we're feeling more and more confident about them. But you know, I would say still not quite as confident as with integers. There's no fundamental reason why there could not be a sub-exponential um, elliptic curve discrete logarithm process found similar to integers, right? Ringers in the back, challenge me if I'm saying something wrong there. Um, we don't know of any. The trick is really sort of a notion of smallness. There are small integers. We can look for small integers and, and take advantage of small integers and do good things. There's no notion of a small point on an elliptic curve. And therefore, all of our methods for integers, which are targeted as, at finding small values and taking advantage of small values, don't seem to make sense there. But you know, somebody might come up with some notion of smallness, which has you know, equivalent properties. Maybe you know, somebody would find something. And you know, it's possible. If that were the case, then elliptic curves wouldn't suddenly become insecure for cryptography. But 256-bit elliptic curves would suddenly become insecure. Um, and we'd have to go up to a larger size, and we'd lose the benefits. Um, to get um, elliptic curve operations to, to work, because they're more cumbersome, we only do get a benefit if we have much smaller key sizes. Right? So if we have, you know, if, if things become sub-exponential, then all bets are off. Um, getting um, good performance often requires use of special curves, and there have been a lot of special curves in the past that have been proposed and determined to not be so secure. So we've gone through a litany of special curves that we should use this because it's really fast. Yeah, it's really fast for attackers, too. Not so good. Um, and in answer to what was said before, um, elliptic curve crypto requires the use of, let's say, sophisticated processes to generate really good curves that we can agree on. And we've got, here are the ones that have been agreed on by the National Institute of Standards and Technology and recommended for everybody. And well, maybe not. Maybe we, maybe we should use these or those. You know, we don't expect individual people to just pick your own favorite elliptic curve. With RSA, Pick two primes, multiply them together, you're good to go. We don't want people trying to do that with elliptic curves. They're a little bit more delicate. So there, there are some trade-offs. OK. So um, that said, I want to say a little bit more about um, other crypto algorithms and elliptic curves. The digital signature algorithm that we talked about at the end of last time, just like Diffie-Hellman, goes through very nicely if we're doing things over elliptic curve and elliptic groups instead of over integers. RSA also works over elliptic groups, but it's insecure. The trick of only I know the factorization, therefore only I can do the inversion, doesn't apply in elliptic curves, um, at least in any way that anybody has found. So RSA, just as it's known, doesn't work there. So that's why we use DSA for signatures. RSA does, signatures don't work there. OK, um, I want to take a few minutes, unless there are any questions on elliptic curves? Yep? Um, what exactly makes elliptic curves so fragile to using your own curves? Um, the, 
There, there are a couple of things. And, and as I said, we have a project that I'm not directly involved in, so I could look at the people in the back and see if you want to say anything. Um, but um, it's mostly a matter of um, trying to balance performance very carefully against security. Um, if you are willing to you know, go with larger curves, um, not a special forms, then you can do pretty well in most cases, right? Yeah, it's not, not a big problem. But if you want to get the sort of optimal performance and squeeze everything out, then if, if, if you take things that are too good in some ways, you get into problems. So as long as you don't try to push the margins too, too carefully, you don't get too much, you don't get too much uh, fragility. But if you try to squeeze out every uh, little bit of performance, that's where things get a little risky. OK, yep. Uh, so you, you mentioned key agreement and signing. Uh, can you talk about encryption with the curves? Well, the way it's typically done is you agree on a key, and then you encrypt with AES or, or symmetric cipher using that key. Um, uh, there is, um, you, you could do what's called Elgamal encryption, which is implicitly the thing you agreed on is your key immediately and you use it as a one-time pad and just send over ciphertext with that as a one-time pad so there isn't a separate step. But uh, effectively, you generally do a, a, some sort of a symmetric step with the agreed upon key, which is what you do with um, integer Diffie-Hellman as well. Uh, between two parties. Yeah. With RSA, you could do public key encryption of a key which is used to encrypt your your text at rest, right? Um, you can, is there although a that with elliptic curve? Well, you you wouldn't typically use RSA in that form because the idea is you have a public key, I can use the public key to, to encrypt to get get a key or encrypt data, send it to you. If I'm just encrypting locally for so my own I'm purposes. Encrypting it, my, your my intended audience, I would use your public key to encrypt the key, right. which I could then leave at rest without communicating with you. Um, right? Yeah. And then I give you the drive at some point, and you so, can read the encrypted data. Right. So we talked a little bit about different versions of Diffie Hellman. And if I have a static public key, you can do the same thing with Diffie Hellman. So you have seen my Diffie Hellman G to the A. I'm Alice here. You've seen my G to the A. Now you can, uh, if I have a static key, you pick a B, you send me G to the B, and you encrypt with G to the A, B. Um, and, and you can do effectively the same thing. OK, so let me spend a few minutes. And I'm really not going to spend a lot of time talking about lattices, but, but they're, they're interesting to know about. So I have to answer the same question I had answered before about elliptic curves. What is a lattice? And of course, once again, we turn to the source of well knowledge, and we get another beautiful definition. <laughs> okay, a lattice is a discrete subgroup of Rn which spans the real vector space, can be generated from a basis, from linear combinations, et cetera, et cetera. Or let's make it a little e easier a lattice, something that looks kind of like that. It's a set of points in a regular pattern, and I'll say a little bit more about what that regular pattern is. but. You know, so if, if we want a two-dimensional lattice, the nicest regular pattern is just a square lattice like that. But they don't have to be square. This is rectangular. It starts to look like an optical illusion if I do this. But this is still you know, um, rectangular, but it's not square anymore. You can have other nice tiling patterns effectively. They don't have to be triangular, but um, things like that. And the where, where it comes from is a basis. So basically, a lattice is formed from a basis, which is a set of vectors. And vectors, think of it as just points right now. So point zero to some point in the plane. Okay? And what we can do is take these vectors and take any linear combination of those with integer coefficients, and the points we get to are the lattice. Okay? So a simple basis for a lattice. The square lattice would be, here's vector 1, here's vector 2, and then I can put it here, and I can easily count how I get from one point to another, right? To get from here to here, it's two v1s plus three v2s, OK? It's really easy to see most of the time how to get from one point to another point if you have a nice, simple basis. But you can have a more complex basis for exactly the same lattice, right? So here's the same lattice. 
it's generated by this basis, but now how do you go from this point to the neighboring point? Um, you can figure it out. You can work it out, but it's not going to be quite so obvious anymore. You have to, to you know, add some of these and then subtract that. So the difference between this and that is a knight's move, if you think of it, you know, over one, up two. So now how do I get from a knight's move? If I go to there, I've got a knight's move maybe down to there, and I can get back to here. OK, you can work it out. But now imagine this with not just two dimensions, but a thousand dimensions, which is the kind of thing we do for crypto. And it can get really ugly. So here's another case. Here's a simple basis for this lattice. This is a pretty clean lattice, and here's a pretty clean basis. And here's an uglier basis for the same lattice. Okay. Uh, you generate exactly the same set of points by, any, by integer combinations of these things. It's just some are easy to see, some are harder to see. So there's something called the closest vector problem in a lattice with a good basis finding nearby lattice points if you're somewhere in the plane, say, or somewhere in space is easy. With a skewed basis, one of these you know, more, more elongated ones, um, finding nearby lattice points can be very difficult. And we can use that for crypto systems in a couple of ways. A lattice-based crypto system typically looks like you generate a key by picking a nice, clean basis for your lattice, things that are almost rectilinear, things that have nice big angles between your, your, your vectors. And you might have literally a 1,000 different vectors. It might be a 1,000 dimensional um, lattice. Um, you then transform your basis into something that's really skewed and ugly. And that's what you give to other people to work with. So they can't manipulate this lattice very easily. And once you have that, you could do a couple of things. Encryption could just be, I give you the skewed basis. You use the skewed basis to pick some lattice point, And you perturb it by a little bit. And what your perturbation is actually your message. So it might be that it's a little down and right of a point, or a little up and left of a point. And that might be a bit, or there might be a, a few bits of just sort of what direction you go from that point. And you decrypt by using a good basis to figure out where the nearby lattice point really is. Um, a more common way to do this is actually a little bit more complicated, is you use your message. You get a, you know, a higher data rate if you do something like this. You use your message um, to, um, to take the, the skewed basis, and the linear combination becomes your message. So it's, let's say it's. Um, I put my message as zeros and ones. Zero times the first basis vector plus one times the second basis vector plus one times the third basis vector, et cetera. I sort of combine them, and I get some point in the lattice. And then I perturb that a little bit, and I give that to you as the encryption. Knowing the good basis, I can, and knowing how I transformed from the good basis to the skewed basis, I can go back and figure out exactly which vectors you combined and how. And, and that's the, the trick. So that's the basis here. Um, once again, we have finite lattices. We don't want infinite things, the usual problem. Um, so we'll do our computation mod some large prime. Same questions, why should we use lattices? It's nice to have different algorithms um, that have very different designs. It turns out that you know, discrete log and factorization and integers are closely related problems. And if, if somebody figured out how to factor, Diffie-Hellman would likely fall apart. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In particular, um, lattice methods seem to be a lot more resistant against quantum attacks. So I'm not planning on talking about quantum computers now. If you want to hear more about quantum computers, bother me another time um, when I'm not about to run off to the airport. Um, and um, if quantum computers developed, you know, lattices would be <coughs> a very good thing to have as, as uh, a cryptographic uh, method. Why not? They're unwieldy. The public keys tend to be enormous, right? A thousand vectors. Those vectors tend to have each, you know, okay, this much in the first dimension and this much in the second dimension, and there are a thousand dimensions, all from a, th a thousand bit prime. And now you have a thousand of those vectors. That's your public key. 
Similarly, the encrypted data tends to be enormous compared to the amount of data that you're actually transmitting. So they're kind of unwieldy. We don't really use them in practice a whole lot. But it's nice to have them in our back pockets just in case. Can you give us a sense of Good. scale when you say the message is unwieldy? So for like a thousand bit vector, how big is the encrypted message? It, it depends. I've, I've sort of sloughed over it because there are different crypto systems using lattices. But it could be that um, it's something like a thousand bits that you transmit with um, a um, a basis point that you've gotten in a thousand dimensions. Um, so it's what a factor of a thousand. Do you know it's roughly a factor of a thousand? And in, in something like Enshu, for instance, um, the the difference between the payload and the size of the encryption. Michael, Michael do you know? Yeah, so, okay, something like a thousand, factor of a thousand. So you, yeah, it, it's hard to work with. Okay, so next session, a lot less math, but we're not getting completely rid of the math. Sort of vulnerabilities, attacks, practical considerations. These actually tie together because it's a lot of the practical tricks that we use to make things more efficient that leads to our vulnerabilities, <laughs> leads to attacks and whatnot. So it's important. We, have, we, know, we want to know about them, we want to do them, but we want to do them carefully because that has been our bane many times. Um, and the final session, what I'm planning on is talking about some applications, um, some of these things. If, if I'm permitted, I'll squeeze an election project. I'm, I'm the flying out right now to Austin to talk to them about to work on their new ele election system design. So it's something I'd like to talk about if, if there's time. But if there are other things people want to do, we can do that in addition or instead. So let me know. OK, any questions? Good. Then I can get off and make my flight. OK, thank you.